Honestly, I wasn't even going to cover this study because I thought it was a pretty boring study. That's not to say that I don't plan on covering more vegan studies, but this particular one only had one factor that made it truly unique. And as you can tell by the title, it was the fact that it was in identical twins, which means that the genetic background of these individuals was as similar as can be had when looking at two distinct people. That is a really cool and informative addition to a study design. But then I looked over the results and I was kind of like, eh, do I really want to spend a week putting together a video on this? Well, Netflix and social media answered that question for me. There's been quite an uproar over this study with some people straight up misrepresenting the data. I'll get to an example of that in a minute. And others declaring it as an almighty win for the vegan diet. Of course, it doesn't help when Netflix releases an inflammatory documentary on the study and some anecdotes from some of the participants of the study. Whenever there's a nutrition documentary that comes out, people jump into their respective boxing corners and begin pummeling the documentary with praise or criticism. So what's the deal here? Well, for those unfamiliar, the researchers recruited 22 pairs of twins, so 44 people, and randomly allocated them to an omnivore diet or a vegan diet. Then, after taking baseline measures of a few blood markers and other markers of health, they tested these same markers eight weeks later, after these individuals had been on their respective assigned diets for eight weeks. The first four weeks, they were hand-fed by the researchers. The researchers would mash up the food in their mouths and spit the... <laughs> Wait, that's a different biology. That's birds. Right. Uh, the researchers had all the food delivered to the participants for the first four weeks to make sure that they were eating the exact foods that they were supposed to. And the following four weeks, the participants were instructed to recreate the meals on their own. If you look at the nutrition reports, everyone did a pretty decent job of recreating the omnivore and vegan meals in the last half of the study. Oh, and there were no differences between the groups at baseline. Okay, that's the background. But what of the results? Why is everyone flipping out over this study? Well, in physionic fashion, let's look at the data. On the vertical axis, we have the relative change in these metrics, and the horizontal axis is all the blood metrics. The p-values that indicate statistical significance are located on the bottom there. If you aren't aware, a p-value of 0.05 or lower is deemed statistically significant. You can see that the dark green or teal color is the omnivore group, and the yellow is the vegan group. So, what changed? Well, the vegan group experienced a drop in low-density lipoprotein cholesterol, which did not occur in the omnivore group. Additionally, the vegan group experienced a drop in insulin levels, as well as some weight loss. Now, I'll address the uh, TMAO, or trimethylamine N-oxide, which is associated with heart disease, in a few minutes. First, I'd like to introduce you to some gripes that I've had with some health influencers' portrayals of this seemingly benign data. It is important to acknowledge that majority of the study subjects were women, yet the investigators focus myopically, it seems, on LDL cholesterol changes between the groups. But what's curious about that is we know that LDL cholesterol is not a significant risk factor for cardiovascular disease. We know that changes in HDL cholesterol, that is reductions in HDL cholesterol, might indicate increased risk for cardiovascular disease, as well as increased triglycerides, which, needless to say, the triglyceride and HDL levels actually shifted in the wrong direction on the vegan diet, but that wasn't actually talked about in the study, which I, I find very curious. So in that short clip, there are a few things to point out, and the full video will be linked for you if you'd like to hear more. One, it's true that LDLC is a weaker predictor of cardiovascular disease, and there are a number of reasons for that. One, the measure of cholesterol molecules found inside the particles containing them, the actual LDL particles, is a less precise marker than measuring LDL particle number directly. However, it's a cheap measure, and it's still used often. It would have been really nice to use a better marker like LDLP as opposed to LDLC or use ApoB, but up to a point, LDLC is a decent measure, even if it isn't ideal. 
That said, studies that pair LDLC and ApoB do show a link with cardiovascular disease. And yes, there are studies that show weaker link in women, but the link was still present across multiple metrics of cardiovascular disease. I can go into why that there might be this reduced, although not eliminated, risk in women in the future. I'd encourage that you uh, check out my multi-study analyses on LDL. There's a tremendous amount that I can't go over here. And although I agree that LDLC is not the best marker, I would not agree that we should ignore it or diminish its importance. We should simply understand it contextually. But that's actually not my main issue with the representation of the study data. Let's look at the uh, data again. What was also pointed out is a downward shift in HDL for the vegan group and an upward shift in triglycerides for the vegan group. This is completely incorrect to interpret this data that way. I've said this many times before, but we can't simply look at the data and not look at the statistics. Yes, it seems like the HDL is going down and it seems like the triglycerides are going up, but the p-values remember that's how we interpret statistical significance via mathematical means, are not 0.05 or lower, or even close, honestly. So the interpretation that HDL shifts down and triglycerides go up is a pipe dream. We have no evidence of that, but why? It's because these massive bars extending from the estimated result, the squares, are error bars. They are statistical representations of uncertainty of the data analysis. Yes, the estimated median result, remember that's the squares, are placed where they are. But the true values could fall anywhere along these lines. This is exactly why the statistics tell us not to assume significance. Because the mathematics behind the statistical analysis indicate there is too much uncertainty to determine a difference. To be clear, that does not mean that there is no difference, but it indicates that we can't make that exact conclusion pointed out in the video, at least based off of the data we have here. And finally, it wasn't discussed by the researchers because it's clearly not statistically significant, and they focused all their attention on the statistically significant outcomes. The same exact argument could be used for glucose because as we see, the results are not even remotely close to statistically significant. So the researchers didn't discuss it beyond showing the data either. Okay, so we shouldn't let our bias get ahead of rigorously analyzing the data as it is. Let's not jump to conclusions that aren't supported. There have been several across both sides of the nutrition world that in my estimation, haven't been representing the results accurately. I'll provide someone who I do feel is sometimes biased, yet did a great job after I discuss two more results seen in this study. Pop up the data again real quick, and you'll notice that there are no differences in TMAO, which is a metabolite made by our gut bacteria that convert choline and carnitine into TMA, or trimethylamine. And that TMA then gets converted to TMAO in the liver. There's been this association between high TMAO and cardiovascular disease for a while now, and the causative nature is being studied. Either way, it might be nice to reduce TMAO just in case. Now, as we just went over, the error bars are massive here, indicating huge uncertainty in the analysis, and we see that the statistics reflect that through a p-value of 0.48. Now, the researchers did notice three participants had wildly different TMAO levels. So they performed a sensitivity analysis where they removed these extraneous data. And they now found that there was an effect that was significant. Now, please note that the colors have switched here. The omnivorous group is now yellow. Clearly, there is a trend downward for the vegan group and the trend upward for the omnivorous group. However, one thing that I haven't seen anyone discuss is the baseline values. I don't know if it's statistically significant because the stats were simply not applied as far as I could tell, but it seems that the baseline values were different, which is a big problem when interpreting data. It might imply a difference at baseline that is the true reason for these changes. Okay, I'll admit it's a stretch, but 
it's entirely possible, unlike if the results had been the same at the beginning. But even if we do away with the TMAO data, and many researchers would argue that you should look at the full data set, not the one with the extraneous data removed, then we can focus on the main outcomes with more certainty. One more thing, which was also correctly brought up by Mike. It would have been nice to see body composition changes because the vegan group consumes six to 7% less protein per meal than the omnivore diet. Additionally, plant protein is not known to be uh, nearly as anabolic one-to-one. -one. So less protein plus less potent protein could yield some muscle loss in the vegan group, which was not measured by the researchers. I know that they plan on releasing more data in the future for future studies on this twin group, so we'll just have to see if they end up reporting it there. Oh, and considering the vegan, actually, instead of me saying it, let's hear this. It's not that it's bad science and should be thrown out, but I'm concerned about the way the findings are being overplayed in the media. We have to be responsible for how we discuss the results and understand the very limited scope of the study and very limited results. The conclusion should be, among high-carb diets, after eight weeks, vegans ate fewer calories, lost more weight, and lowered LDL and insulin a little more than those following a high-carb omnivore diet. But we're not able to extrapolate these findings to any other comparison of plant or animal foods. <laughs> that's a lot less interesting than just saying vegan diet improves heart health and we should all eat more plants, right? That's much more catchy. So Dr. Scher has certainly had a more low carb bent to his content. And I don't agree with all of his content, but I think that he did a fair job of representing the study at hand here. He's right to rein in the conclusion of the study and contextualize it. He, and he also mentions that the vegan group was in a calorie deficit, around 400 calories, while the omnivore group was in a 200 calorie deficit. So that's not massive, but over two months, that really does start to stack up. So should we send Paul Revere yelling, the vegan diet is superior, the vegan diet is superior, as he rides to Lexington? History buffs will get that reference. Well, the answer is maybe, and here's why. For one, while both diets included healthy vegetables, no processed foods, and other healthy elements, the vegan diet also had lower protein and lower calories. So this isn't a knock on the diet. It just means that the people who switch to a vegan diet, as prescribed, would experience the benefit of weight loss. The muscle component is still up in the air, but the weight loss is usually seen as a good thing. However, it also then raises the question, of if the diet makeup was the reason for the improved insulin values and LDLC values, or the weight loss was the catalyst. I realize that for most people, you probably don't care. An improvement is an improvement, and I agree. However, from a scientific standpoint, we can't rule out that the very same omnivorous diet might not yield the exact same results if it had also been designed to be isocaloric, so the same calories, as the vegan diet, yielding similar weight loss. That isn't a knock on the researchers. They simply chose to have both groups eat as much as they wanted, which is more appropriate for translating to daily life. And it just so happens that the vegan diet was superior under these parameters and measures. So hopefully now you can see why I think that the twin aspect is really cool, but because of unexplained variables, confounding factors, and the limited scope of the study, it had me kind of like, eh. There are better vegan studies, albeit without the wonderful genetic benefit of this study, and I'll cover them for you. But you might be interested in checking out one of my other videos of mine right here. In the meantime, I'll catch up with you later. Get it? Catch up? Vegan jokes aren't my specialty, admittedly.